Hey guys, you can be seated. Um, I get the pleasure of, uh, I'm gonna, this is gonna be a long introduction, I'm gonna, okay. Uh, it's okay, I'll need it back. Um, have you ever met, you know, you ever met people and uh, when you meet them, you, you just kind of sense, um, you kind of sense um, the, well, I hate, to, I hate to use the presence of God because that, that's just kind of like a, an overkill, I think, and sometimes or it's kind of really, really, really religious. But you really sense in them that, uh, that their love for Jesus is, is genuine. Um, you ever just meet somebody like that and you, you just, when you, when you meet them, you just kind of know uh, that they're just, you know, they're, they're, their love for Jesus and, uh, and what they profess about Christ um, is is true, and, and they live it. And uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Tim Pinkson. See, he's going to come up here in a minute. But uh, Tim is one of those guys. I haven't known Tim very long. Um, his wife and my wife have been friends um, uh, a while, and they work together. Uh, Tim uh, was in ministry for about 30 years, and he pastored about three or four different churches up in North Carolina. Uh, he had a stroke in 2008. Which, um, which obviously led him uh, out of the ministry for for a while, as far as being a full time pastor, and he was also uh, worked with the volunteer fire department. They moved down here to Oak Island in 2011, and um, and uh, he just he was just he he has a shepherd's heart, and uh, so they just started a church up in their house, uh, which I think is just. It's kind of like the gospel, isn't it? Isn't that kind of like what Acts says? You know, so, uh, he just, you know, that's what they've done. And, uh, and so he pastors a, a church out of his house. Uh, he's got a real shepherd's heart. Um, he, he just has a shepherd's heart. He loves people. Uh, and that, to me, tells me he loves Jesus because Scripture tells us that if we are to love the Lord thy God with all our heart, body, mind, and soul, that the second one that we liken to the first, and the second one is that do we love our neighbors? So we show our love for God by loving people. And Tim does that um, uh, in a remarkable way. So uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't preach this morning, even though I'm kind of doing it anyway right now um, in this small introduction, but I really wanted to hear what God had laid on his heart. And, uh, and I'm, I just... I know you guys are going to be thrilled with it too. So, Tim, if you would come up, brother, and just share what God's laid on your heart this morning with us. I appreciate it. You know, you cannot get a true, genuine preacher to not preach, it's impossible. If there were an exception to God's word, it would be in that verse, all things are possible except for that. But uh, My wife, Lynette, and I are blessed to be with you today. We are honored to be here amongst you, and we have been looking forward to this since Scott called me and said, I'm just not sure I'll be physically able to, to stand there in the pulpit and do what I need to do and what I want to do. And I know that's hard to do. As uh, Scott mentioned, I had a stroke several years ago, and uh, first of all, the, the doctors didn't really expect me to live, but God had another plan. And uh, what I was doing then was actually serving as minister for my home congregation that I had grown up in, and, and uh, that wasn't working real well either. I couldn't do all the things I needed to do and felt like I needed to do for them, and they just kept making excuses and saying, just do what you can do. And, but that wasn't a good arrangement for us or them, and so they wouldn't let me resign, so the only thing I could do was sell our house and belongings and move to the beach. <laughs> so I thought it was a great plan, and apparently God endorsed it because here we are. But, uh, you know, a lot of times we, we run into things in life. We run into those difficulties, don't we? We all do, and we do it over and over, and a lot of those things we don't have control over. One of the things, as, as Scott and I spoke the other day, that, that he wanted us to cover today as we worship God were the events of one week ago in Las Vegas. Tragic events, horrendous events. You know, it's not pleasant to talk about these things, is it? 
But that's a part of reality. It's part of our world. It's part of our life. We had 9-11. We had Sandy Hook. We have natural disasters that we have no control over. But what we can do is respond. What we can do is be ready. And that's a part of our mission as the Lord's church, isn't it? As we think about Las Vegas a week ago, we think about almost 60 lives lost and some 500 injured, many of them injured multiple times with gunshot wounds from a high-powered rifle. That's tragic. In fact, it's so tragic that, that we as Christians, I think sometimes, particularly in a case like this, we even struggle to, to not be overwhelmed. And we struggle within our spirit to try and even process how that could happen. How could someone even think of the idea, much less carry it out, to amass an armory of guns and ammunition and elevate themselves ab above a huge crowd of 20,000 plus people and then open fire on them for no reason at all, without provocation. I know there are a lot of unanswered questions at this point and I know the investigation will go on for some time, but what do we do right now? What do we do one week later with what happened in Las Vegas? And so that's, that's the basis of our thoughts and our lesson. As always, we, we know we can turn to God's word and, and find answers. But when we look at the information that's been given to us, when we see people like Heather Alvarado from Cedar City, Utah, 35 years old, when news spread that there was a shooting going on in Las Vegas, some members of her fire department there back home went to their home because they knew she was at the concert and her husband had been a member of their fire department for eight or nine years. Shortly after they arrived, they received news that she had been killed. She too had been a member of that fire department for a number of years and was highly involved in the ladies auxiliary a young lady whose presence in that community will be sorely missed. There are people like Jack Beaton, age 54, of Bakersfield, California, who attended the concert with his wife so that they could celebrate their 23rd wedding anniversary. As the shooting started, he told his wife to get on the ground and he draped his body over hers to protect her. Shortly thereafter, he was shot. The Lord blessed him with just enough time to speak to his wife and say, Honey, I love you. And he lived just long enough to hear his wife say, I love you too, and I'll see you in heaven. And then he passed away. You know, that is senseless. And again, what we struggle to process how that could happen in our society and in our culture in this day and time. There's Stacy Echebar from Novato, California, age 50. As people around her started falling to the ground, her husband, a San Francisco police officer, sprang into action and began to shout for everyone to scatter. And there were a couple of small areas of protection nearby and he was rushing people into those areas. In that action, he was separated from his wife briefly as he went back to get her and, and push her to safety as well. He was shot and killed. They live in a small community and she was a hairstylist there. And everyone in the community says, we're gonna mourn her loss for a long time because she was a bright spot in our community. And they've set about to raise money for her funeral expenses and to help their family. And in just a few short days, they raised over $200,000. Stacy's brother-in-law sums it up fairly well. He says, we're angry, we're frustrated, 
and we're devastated and understandably so. When an event so tragic as this takes so many good people from among us, it's hard to understand. It's hard to process. What we're gonna look at for the next few minutes is very basic and very brief. But hopefully it will help us to, to renew our faith and our trust in God and our understanding of a couple of other key things that are vastly important to us as believers in the Lord. In 1 John 5 and verse 19, there's a verse that quite honestly, I'm not very fond of. In fact, I try to avoid this verse. But you know, when you ask the Lord to lead you to where you need to end up, you're supposed to listen. And so when Scott called me the other day, and I said, sure, I'll be glad to do that. And I hung up and I thought, oh my goodness, what did I get myself into? He wants us to talk about what? We can't resolve that. But this is the verse that I kept being drawn to. It's that verse that I wish wasn't in the Bible, but it is. So I have to pay attention to it and I have to understand how important it is to my life and your life. In that verse, in just a few words, God defines the problem, doesn't he? And we know that we are of God. I hope we know that. If we're in doubt about that, which we'll talk about in a minute, we need to do something about that doubt. We need to overcome that doubt. We need to renew our faith and our love for the Lord and our fellowship with his saints. We need to get busy doing the things God wants us to do. We know that we are of God and the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. That last part I don't like. I love that first part. That last part just leaves a bad taste in our mouth, doesn't it? I don't like to think about the fact that the whole world is under the sway or the influence of Satan. But didn't Jesus say that the vast majority of people would even reject him? He knew that would happen, but he died on that cross anyway. And so all we're doing here is clarifying that we are of God and the world is under the influence of Satan. And that is the dividing line between right and wrong. And hopefully we're on the correct side of that line. But whichever side of that line we're on, there will always be conflict where those two forces come together. There will always be conflict where those two forces come together. Now, how long has that been going on? Since right after the very beginning. Genesis chapter 3. We know this story. Let's just refresh our memory briefly. Beautiful place that God has created. Adam and Eve are there, created in the image of God. All kinds of bushes and trees and fruits and flowers and animals. Among that is that old serpent, Satan. He can't stand it, can he? Satan hates things that are nice and beautiful and worthwhile and purposeful. He hated the fact that God and Adam and Eve had a close relationship. We really see that later, don't we? When after they've taken of the fruit and God comes into the garden, what do they do? They run and hide. They heard God walking through the garden. Isn't that cool? I love that part of the story. Hear God walking through the garden. But something has drastically changed in their relationship by that point. How did that happen? We know. We've read it many, many times. But again, let's just refresh our memory a little bit. Satan comes up to Eve and says, Did God really say you couldn't eat any of the fruit in the garden? And you see, the first thing he does is exaggerate. He likes to do that too, doesn't he? Did God really say you couldn't partake of all this beautiful, wonderful fruit that's all around you? Fruit of all these trees? Did God really say that's off limits? Why, 
what he's really implying is why would God do that? Why would he tell you you can't participate and partake of these things that are so beautiful and pleasant? He's exaggerating, isn't he? Eve knows the truth because she responds. No, he didn't say that. But he did say we're not supposed to partake of that fruit over there, that tree in the midst of the garden. What is that? Here's how I would summarize that. That's called doubt. That's the first crowbar that Satan uses to pry us away from Christ. Doubt. Doubt that it really happened the way the Bible says it happened. Doubt that the Lord really cares about you. Doubt that you can even make a difference. How many things do we doubt even as Christians? Hmm. Doubt. The first tool, the first weapon in the arsenal of Satan is doubt. Again, they go on in conversation. What did God really say? Well, no, he didn't say that exactly, but he did tell us not to partake of that fruit over there. Verse 3. The serpent said to the woman, If you take of that fruit, you will surely not die. Now, there's a sprinkling of truth in that from one perspective and one definition. It's not like she's going to eat it and it's like the poison apple and she just falls over dead physically. That's deception, isn't it? After Satan starts out with a doubt, the next step he goes to is deception. He's going to use a little bit of truth, but twist it. Does Satan ever do that in our lives? Never happened, has it? Never will. Satan loves to do that. He loves to throw in just enough truth that we take the bait. Make it just believable enough that we'll go for it. And I've said this for, for 30 years now. If Satan walked through those doors back there in a red leotard with a pointed tail, horns, and a pitchfork, we would know. And we would respond accordingly. But Satan doesn't do that, does he? He is cunning. He is shrewd. And he outsmarts us so many times because we fall for his deception. You will not surely die. And then what does he do? He shows Eve. I mean, look at this. Why would God deny you this fruit? Look at it. Look at how pleasant it looks. Look. Smell that. Smell that. Doesn't that smell good? Isn't it pleasing to look at? What does he say? The reason God doesn't want you to eat that is because then you'll be like him and you'll know the difference between good and evil. But by then, the desire of Eve has been piqued. Right? So what does she do? She looks at that. She says, ooh, that, that looks nice. I wonder if it tastes as good as it looks. And maybe she desires to have that knowledge, that somewhat of an equality with God. So the doubt has kicked in, the deception has kicked in, and that third D is desire. And by the time we get to that, a lot of times we're in trouble, aren't we? We're just like Eve. We have fallen through the doubt of our own hearts and minds, for the deception of Satan, and then our own desire kicks in and we fall. What did Satan do when he encountered Christ in Matthew chapter 4? Jesus goes out into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by Satan. It says right there, that's a part of his purpose for going there, right? Satan didn't come to him on day one. Satan didn't come to him on day two or day three. He waited 40 days. Then he went to Jesus. 
You know what? He used the same basic approach, didn't he? If you are the Son of God, what is that? Doubt. If you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread and feed yourself. Because I know you're hungry. You've been out here 40 days. Then he takes him into the temple. Throw yourself off. Because it says in the Bible, and he quotes scripture, because that's what Jesus usually does to him. But again, that's deception. It's twisting the message, isn't it? Jesus doesn't fall for that. He answers him with scripture. And then thirdly, what does Satan do? To even Christ. Takes him up on a high mountain and shows him all the glories of the world. Beautiful things and places. He says, all these things I'll give you if you'll just bow down and worship me. Well, thanks be to God, Jesus didn't come to save things. He came to seek and save that which is lost. He didn't want those earthly kingdoms. He didn't want those things that were shiny and bright and fair and valuable in the eyes of the world. He came for people. John 8 and verse 44 tells us that we need to resist Satan. There's no truth in him. Why? He's full of deception. That's his purpose. James 4, 7 tells us, resist. What does that mean? Resist means to take a stand against Satan. Now, I tell you what I picture in my mind. I, I picture some of those ancient armies as they came toe to toe for battle and they ranked together with one another and they folded their shields over one another's shields and they readied their weapons for battle. Because the battle is real. It's about to happen. Our battle with Satan is real. It happens every day. And the more we try to do the right thing, what happens? The more Satan is there to try to spoil it. We know that. We've experienced that. Just the other day, when I started working on this lesson on the computer, guess what happened to my computer? I know that's not a computer term, but... That's what happened. And I could stand here and say, you know, that's probably Satan in my computer, which is why I guess I wanted to take a ball bat and beat it to death. <laughs> when we want to do something good and positive and, and righteous and holy, Satan will try to spoil it. He always has, he always does, and he always will. I want to draw our attention briefly to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We're reminded in the opening passage there, and again, I'll, I'll try to be very brief, and I'm paraphrasing, obviously. Our God is the God of mercies. He is a God of comfort. He is a God of compassion. You see, compassion isn't something God does. It is something God is. That's true of a lot of aspects of God, isn't it? Loving isn't something God does. It's something he is. It is his very nature. It defines him. What about us as Christians? What about when we need to stand up against Satan? And we know that's kind of hard sometimes, isn't it? It's hard to take a stand against Satan. But we need to do so instinctively. Going to church is great and admirable. But how much better is it to be the church? Going to church is a start. But we need to be the church. It needs to be our very nature. It needs to be what defines us as people. It needs to be automatic. It needs to be instinctive. I think of some of those individuals last Sunday night who, when the bullet started flying, instantly, as soon as they figured out what was going on, they instantly set their life aside to try to help other people. And time and time again, as we begin to read through these details of, of what happened, we see these stories of people who selflessly ended up giving their lives to save others. 
And the experts, even at this point, that have begun to examine exactly what happened, have clearly stated that their actions saved hundreds of lives. Their selfless, instinctive actions saved hundreds of lives of other people, even though some of them themselves perished as a result. Are we instinctive Christians or are we light switch Christians or flip switch Christians or checklist Christians? We need to be instinctive and automatic in our response to God and his word and his spirit and the opportunities that God puts before us. It's great when we respond, even if we need a nudge or a committee or a plan or whatever we need to get it done, but it's even better, I believe, to be instinctive in our response and our reaction to the opportunities that we have to do good. One of the first things that Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount was that we need to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. If anybody here has a screen printing shop, I have an idea for a t-shirt that just says, get salty. I guess I could have several different meanings here at the coast. But we need to get more salty. Because Jesus says if we lose our saltiness, what are we good for? Be cast out and trod under foot of men. Then he says, you're the light of the world. You know that little song we learned when we were little kids? You don't light the candle and put it under a bushel. But you put it on a candle stand so it illuminates the whole house so people can see where they're going and what they're doing and they won't trip and they won't fall and they won't stumble. We need to be the light of the world. I know that sounds very simplistic, but sometimes that's where we need to start, isn't it? Let's start with the basic, fundamental, simple things Understand that Satan is going to try to bring doubt into our hearts every single time we attempt to do something good and right. And he will try to deceive us. And he will use our own desires against us to bring about that fall. That we need to be the salt instinctively, automatically, as a firefighter for many years, I had to learn to do things instinctively because some of the things I was supposed to do didn't really make sense to me, especially to start with. The first one being, rush into a burning building. <laughs> Nothing about that makes any sense, does it? But over the years, you learn why, because in many cases, there were people in those buildings. And you better know what you're doing when you go in there. And so you train. I know Lynette used to get so frustrated every Monday night and a lot of Tuesday nights. Every week, you go to the fire station and you train. And you train and you train. Because when you go into a real burning building, you better know what you're doing. You need to act instinctively. On the sleeve of a turnout jacket for a firefighter, there's not a little pocket for a cheat sheet. You get to that point, you have to know what you're doing. And the other thing about that, the reason firefighters usually call each other a brotherhood is because you have to learn to trust the guy next to you, too, that he knows what he's doing. How do you do that? You train together. As the salt of the earth and light of the world, we need to be instinctive, and we need to train and equip and practice godliness to the point that when something happens around us, we don't have to stop and form a committee and go back and see what the scripture says. We know what to do. Hopefully because we've already responded many other times before to the opportunities and needs around us. In closing, I want to share a, a little picture with you. And I'll preface this a little bit. It's kind of hard to see what that is, so I'm going to explain what it is. This is the light switch in our grandson's bedroom. He's five. Thus, the little uh, dinosaur stickers on the wall there. We were at their house before he was even five. And of course, we're starting that wind down routine 
of get your bath, get your pajamas on, get ready for bed. Well, grandma and grandpa were there and he didn't want to go to bed. So while his mother was in there running his bath water, he slipped back to the bedroom. We didn't realize it. So Lynette and Megan gave Rowan his bath and I was sitting in the living room probably watching TV or something. And so then it got time to read the bedtime book and say his prayers. And Megan left with him to go put him in the bed and lay there with him a minute while he went to sleep. She came back, she was dying laughing. She said, y'all have gotta come back here and see this. He had gone while she ran the bathwater, got a roll of tape and taped his light switches up. Because at five years old, he knew as long as the lights are on, I can stay awake. Because the last thing that happens is mama turns off the lights and then I have to go to sleep. Five years old, not really quite five. If he could figure that out, surely we can. We are the light of the world by God's purpose and design. Every single day we will have opportunities to respond instinctively and show the people around us God's love and God's light. How are we doing at that job? Here's the tough part, right? Here's the self-examination and self-evaluation that we need to go through. We need to be sure when it comes to our relationship with the Lord, our light switches are taped up. And Satan understands that. We need to ready ourselves either by ourselves or collectively to repel Satan, to resist Satan. To, do you ever say during your day, do you ever say, thank you, Lord? I do all that, all kinds of and stuff that's weird to some people, probably. I say, thank you, Lord. Because Thank you, Lord, my computer finally worked the other day. You know, sometimes it's those little things. Well, sometimes I think maybe we need to say out loud to Satan because his presence is in the whole world. We read that a while ago, didn't we? His influence is everywhere. You say, Satan, Jesus did it. Get behind me, Satan. Or I like this one maybe a little better. Satan, could you shift over a little bit because I can't see the cross of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You're blocking my view. Now, Satan, could you scoot over? I think I see an empty tomb over there behind you because I serve a risen Savior. I serve the one that defeated you in death. I serve the one that's coming back to claim his own. Is our love for God instinctive as his love for us is instinctive? God doesn't forgive as an act. He forgives because of who he is. Today, in the aftermath of Las Vegas, we pray for the victims, we pray for their families, we pray for those that have been wounded and, and all of their families. We pray for the first responders who will never be the same after last Sunday. We also need to pray for ourselves, don't we? Perhaps right here, right now among us, there are those of us that realize we have fallen for Satan's deception. Maybe our heart has doubts about our relationship with God or the truth of his word or, or why worship is so important or the validity of the church. Maybe we've been deceived by Satan to the point that we've given up on our walk with the Lord. Maybe we've got to that point of desire of worldliness and, and power and passion and, and belongings that we tripped ourselves up and, and caused ourselves to drift off. Maybe this is that moment when we say to Satan, 
get behind me. You know, every passage that brings up the idea of repelling Satan also has a positive side. Turn to God in faith. You will overcome the world because he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. <laughs> we hear it, we read it, but we still don't always trust it, do we? We doubt. Maybe today is the day we, we stop that doubt. We have, if you'll excuse my expression, we have the guts and the faith and the fortitude like some of those people did last Sunday night to throw their lives, put their body in front of others, sometimes total strangers, and say, I instinctively know this is the right thing to do. Maybe now is the moment we ask God to be our leader and our purpose. And we repel Satan from our life because we know how that story ends. Let's bow together. Father, we thank you for your awesome love and grace and mercy. Father, we never deserved it. We can never earn it, but you sent your son to die on that cross for us anyway. Father, we thank you for that greatest gift of all. Father, many times you know that we fall for Satan's traps. He causes doubt within our hearts and our minds and our spirits. He deceives us. He leaves us to our own desires. Father, purify our hearts. Show us our purpose. May your will be our will. May your character be what we strive for, of righteousness and purity and holiness. Father, right now we invite you more than ever before into our hearts and lives. Cleanse us, forgive us, and lead us in the right way. Help us, Father, to be your people. Help us to meet the challenges and see the opportunities that are placed before us every single day of our lives. Father, help us to make that turn of our focus and our purpose toward you. Father, we know that you will bless us, that you will lead us, you will guide us, you will protect us. In the end, through your Son, you will claim us to be your own. Father, we need you. We depend on you. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you this morning. I hope that you've been blessed. I know you've blessed me and Lynette. As always, we pray that what we've done together here is just the beginning. When we go out those doors, the real challenge starts, doesn't it? Because we're going to go to Walmart this afternoon. I know that's a challenge. One final parting word of advice. When you say out loud, get behind me, Satan, you might want to avoid doing what I did one time in the checkout at Walmart after the third time this lady ran over my ankles with her shopping cart and then cut me off in the checkout line. And I said out loud, just enough for her to hear me, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> Obviously, that wasn't the time or place to do that. But I promise you, if he hasn't already while we've been here, when we leave here, he's going to be waiting for us out there. But we're ready for him now. We've reminded ourselves why it's so important to trust in God and resist Satan. Because our lives and perhaps the lives of others around us depend on that decision. Let's remember that. Let's embody that. And let's instinctively, automatically show that we love our God and our Creator. May God bless you through this day and every day and whatever we say or do and wherever we go that we are the light of this world. Thank you.